Welcome to the EduTrends podcast and webcast brought to you by the Institute for the Future of Education of Tecnológico de Monterrey. I am Jose Pepe Escamilla, Institute for the Future of Education Associate Director, and today's episode guest is uh, Michelle Weiss. Uh, Michelle is an education and workforce strategist and author of the book Long Life Learning. It's a pleasure to have you here, Michelle. So great to be here with you, Pepe. Great. So, um, but you recently published uh, this book, um, Long Life Learning. Um, why, why is this book relevant today? Yeah, I, I think it's, you know, just like you, we've been to millions of conferences, right? And, and I think everyone sort of intuitively agrees with this idea of lifelong learning. The thing that kind of struck me as I was listening to people sort of prognosticate and predict around the future of work and the future of education was that even though we were all sort of agreeing that we all needed to be lifelong learners to keep up with this very uncertain world of work ahead, I wasn't actually seeing a lot of changes in terms of people's investment theses. So I wasn't seeing funders you know, think about what is that infrastructure going to look like? And even education providers, I think we're sort of thinking maybe continuing education or our extension school might take care of that, or maybe MOOCs are the answer. But I wasn't seeing a lot of shifting and transformation happening. And so this book is really an attempt to kind of push us into action. And that really is just this, this idea of a longer life, the mental model of just extending our work lives a little bit more. And there are some, some experts on aging and longevity who are thinking that our lifespans could get substantially longer. And even, you know, thinking that children born today could live to be 150 years old. But even if we just stretch it out a little bit, you know, we're all staying in the workforce for far longer than we had anticipated. We're going through more job changes than we ever dreamed of. And as we think about technology or technological advancements and how they're, you know, really transforming the nature of work, that number of job changes is only going to increase over time. And so it suddenly becomes very clear to us that our systems, our education systems, our workforce systems are not really set up to help us, you know, in a 60, 80, 100 year work life. And for me, that was sort of the impetus for figuring out how we move towards change rather than just sort of, you know, obsessing over the statistics and the millions of jobs that we would lose to automation. All of that stuff's down most kind of fearful sounding or just paralyzing. And this idea of a longer work life really helps us kind of jumpstart into action and think, oh my goodness, we need to start building now because all of us are going to have to depend on a better lifelong learning ecosystem. Yes, um, um, great uh, uh, great idea. The book is uh, in fact very uh, important in these times. So uh, with the extension of a lifespan and uh, changes in the workforce due to industry 4.0 no, or the automation, et cetera, uh, we need to change, you say, we need to change uh, a lot of things in our educational system, I would say formal like universities, but also uh, education for work or, or life of learning. What will be the, the main changes that you foresee uh, that we have to start right now to be able uh, to be prepared for these changes. Yeah, I think it's helpful, like you just did, to divide up sort of the formal education sphere and then also just kind of continuous returns to learning over that longer work life. Because from, you know, as we think about pre-K through all the way through post-secondary education and tertiary education, uh, our systems have kind of look the same for centuries, right? And we divide up our our disciplines into specific silos or departments. And we always think about, you know, teaching our learners to solve a problem in this particular discipline. And I think we really have to get to the business of truly thinking about interdisciplinary learning, but really doing it at scale and system-wide across a particular school or a school district or a university system. You know, I think people tend to integrate things like problem-based learning at, you know, a course level. You know, someone's going to do their senior thesis and their, or their final capstone project, and it's going to be that thing that is really, 
you know, problem-based. But as we think about that uncertain world of work ahead, we can't fully anticipate every single skill we need to build in order to meet the challenges ahead. What we do know is it's going to be a real mix and hybrid nature of human and technical skills. We have to bring our sort of uniquely human uh, perspective, you know, our way of thinking about judgment, exercising judgment and having emotional intelligence and empathy and ways of thinking about systems versus, you know, just very narrow problems. That's going to really help us coordinate with machines, with robots, with computers. But we also need a really healthy mix of technical skills. And while we can't necessarily identify every single skill we need to be successful in the future, we do know that we really need to be the best problem solvers in the world. And that means being able to encounter a highly ambiguous circumstance synthesize information, evaluate the context, and be able to begin making data-driven decisions, right? And, and integrating qualitative research, all these different kinds of skills that we know we are trying to build in our learners in K-12 or post-secondary education, college, university. We know those are the skills we're trying to imbue in our learners, but we haven't actually started really breaking down the structures of our systems to really cultivate that real world problem based learning at scale. Right. And so one of the examples I think of that's happening right now in the in the world is in the UK, there is um, there's an innovator named Carl Gombrecht who's who's building the London Interdisciplinary School. And he's really trying to get at this idea of real world problem solving. And so what he's doing is instead of setting up 45 different departments with 45 different faculty members of this new university, he's having nine faculty members teach 45 different disciplines. And so that's the way that you kind of demonstrate to your, your current learners, right? This is the way we solve problems. It's not just within this bounded area. It's across disciplines, right? And this is how we use principles across and, you know, seemingly un unrelated domains and use them here. So there's that kind of like dramatic transformation that really needs to occur at our formal education level. But then as we think about you know, sometimes we're just going to need to skill up a tiny bit when you're going to need like one competency or four competencies or 11 competencies to stay competitive in our job. We're not going to necessarily want to go back and get yet another degree, right? We're going to want sort of a just in time solution that is targeted and precise and also fits in with our very busy lives so that we can, again, remain relevant in that uncertain workforce. Um, so I think that's the kind of mix we're going to have is not only do we have to rethink our existing infrastructure and our systems, you know, at the elementary, secondary, post-secondary levels, but we also have to start thinking about unbundling and really offering specific, precise, targeted learning experiences that can help people make progress in their lives. Okay, great. Right. Very interesting. Um, and it uh, also reminds me of our uh, Tech 21 educational model in Tech de Monterrey that is uh, challenge based. Uh, we yes, you were here, I think, before we launched the first uh, full generation. We we started in August 2019, uh, where students um, spend around 50% of the time uh, solving challenges, real world challenges with real clients. Uh, People from the business, government, industry, the non-governmental organizations. Yeah. And the reality is not divided in silos. Uh, those uh, challenges are co-developed with uh, faculty from these uh, two academic departments, two disciplines, no? Yeah. Because uh, the reality is like that. And what we want is to develop these uh, uh, so-called soft skills that are so important in the future to uh, stay relevant, no? no matter what are the new uh, uh, the new uh, jobs or the jobs of the future, uh, those things that make us human uh, are uh, and that allow us to interact with machines are, are very important. And the only way to develop them is in a, uh, in a more real world class, real world situations than uh, in class uh, abstract 
yeah. uh, disciplinary teaching. No? So uh, I think this is the, the kind of things that we need, but it's very difficult for uh, universities to make uh, that kind of change. No? I, yeah. I think, uh, so I, I wonder if you have some ideas or how can we approach um, this in a more systemic way to uh, to uh, be able to achieve this kind of change in universities. Yeah, it, it, you're, you're completely right. It, it all comes down to incentives, right? And I think when you think about the structure of a university setting in particular and the way that, you know, adjunct professors or full-time professors keep their jobs and stay successful in their jobs, they're thinking about what are the advancement, the tenure, the promotion processes that exist that, you know, make my lifestyle sustainable, right? It's inevitable. Like that's what we think about. We're incentivized by these different processes that exist. And as just one example, in most universities, it doesn't pay to teach really well, right? It's about research or it doesn't pay to actually collaborate closely with a colleague from a totally different department, right? You don't earn extra bonus points by, you know, co-teaching courses. In fact, that's kind of looked down upon or stigmatized, right? Because you're not, you're not doing that work on your own. And so we really have to kind of step back as, you know, if we're in a university system and look at what are the incentive structures we have created that are maybe leading to this behavior or this particular resistance to change or, right, like this, this inertia. Uh, usually it comes down to what are the incentives that are in place that are driving that behavior. And I think if we can kind of start rethinking some of those models, it really will potentially catalyze a change in behavior. But for the moment, it's really hard to, to suggest to someone to do something so different from what um, what has been working just fine for them, right? Why would they completely rethink their curriculum when people are paying or people are are still coming and and attending these classes? Why would I go through that dramatic change? But I think as we think about, you know, particularly, you know, as you think of Tech de Monterrey or Tech Milenio, right? Like as you think about these different really innovative solutions out there. The sad part is that you guys are outliers, right? You guys are anomalies in the system where you are really thinking very deliberately about how do we expand the amount of time people are working on real world problems? And I think we can each think of maybe 10, 20 different examples in the world of really amazing schools doing this kind of work, but it shouldn't be the case that we can name all of them. Right. It should be it should be happening everywhere. Everyone should be doing this across the entire learning experience. But instead, we're always kind of isolating. Oh, there's this really great school, you know, in San Diego that does this really well. Right. Or there's this really interesting school in Singapore that does this. That shouldn't be the case. It should be across the globe. Right. Just happening everywhere. I shouldn't be able to mention that London Interdisciplinary School as something special. Right, and that's that's one of the challenges we have. Yeah, so I um, I agree with you that uh, the incentives are not uh, the right ones, no, that, that we need. But I also believe it's it will be difficult to change that because uh, the way universities are constructed with uh, all the um, bodies of uh, decision, no, the senate, uh, etc are um, are done to maintain status quo so change yeah. uh, is uh, difficult and we we have to find out ways of uh, introducing change maybe in some areas of the university maybe uh, uh, creating uh, a new uh, school that has a different way of working or a different different ways of uh, um, achieving tenure that are not the, the regular mm -hmm. ones based on on uh, on research, uh, for instance. Uh, so, uh, well, it's I think still a lot of work to do. Yeah, I'm not that optimistic, but uh, we have to work on that. Yeah, it's going to be very slow, and unfortunately for most universities, it's not going to be a real thing that they're going to deliberately strategize around until 
maybe the university or college is in financial duress, right? Once they're stressed financially, Mm -hmm. then they might be willing to entertain something pretty novel and distinct and a way of Mm -hmm. differentiating themselves from their competitors. But I think the, both the universities and the companies that are really going to thrive in the future are going to maybe try to do some parallel efforts, even if it's maybe not potentially possible to do this within our existing system or structure, maybe we can uh, think about an incubation zone, right? A different kind of unit that might be able to test the bounds of, of what is possible to change and, you know, and where you have really early adopters who don't need to be convinced of why this is necessary, right? It's this kind of incubation zone or this autonomous growth unit where you can really start to 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 play around and experiment with these models. I mean, this is this is what you guys do so well is that you do separate your models um, and you're testing out kind of in small ways within the existing model ways to push the bounds. But I think you really do have to do both at once because it's this idea of, you know, jumping to your next S curve, right? It used to be possible that as your business model is declining, you can figure out something new for the future but now you have to do both at the same time, right? You have to kind of build the thing that's in the sustaining trajectory and build the thing that might be potentially disruptive at the same time. And that's really hard. That's really, really hard for even the most forward-leaning institutions. And um, that, that's um, a good example of uh, how uh, you can change uh, from uh, uh, internal uh, this an internal decision or an external decision like uh, we we did change d- during the pandemic very fast because we were forced uh, to do that and mm-hmm. one of those forces could be uh, financial difficulties and I I'm I, I'm not sure what do you think that could be part of the future I I, I think uh, uh, well one one of the reasons could be that uh, there's a disruption from other Yes. Uh, stakeholders. Uh, what, what, what's in your mind when you say that? Yeah. So thinking about a couple of different trends. Uh, one is, so obviously I'm coming at it from a U.S. perspective, but mm-hmm. within the U.S., um, we really peaked back in 2013 with the number of degree granting institutions we have. So at one point we had over 4,700 colleges and universities. Just over these last eight or nine years, that is really kind of actually contracted in a substantial way. So when I wrote the book, even just a couple of years ago, the number was down to fewer than 4,300 institutions. So already we had seen the contraction of about 400 plus universities either merging, uh, going bankrupt, right, folding. And then the pandemic just adds a whole other layer of stress. So We know that enrollments are falling. We know that this younger generation of learners isn't necessarily assuming that they're going to go to college. Uh, And then what's even more worrisome is that we know in the mid-2030s, there's going to actually be this kind of huge cliff in terms of the number of enrollments who would traditionally be in that kind of 18 to 24-year-old category, your traditional college goers. It's going to severely contract to the point where we are going to see kind of a massive uh, shift in in our universities and colleges who are not prepared for that enrollment decline. Um, There's also really interesting and, you know, not fully understandable yet things that are happening in the shadow sector of education. So as you think about the MOOCs that exist and these different kinds of combinations of, you know, to you and edX, right. And these different groups that are working in this uh, sort of micro credential space or this, you know, non-formal education or non-accredited work. uh, There's really interesting possibilities uh, where those kinds of players in the field are going to start putting enormous pressure on these colleges and universities who are suddenly going to realize, oh, if our 18 to 24-year-old population is declining, we better start thinking about working learners, right? People who are just trying to upskill and reskill 
in the workforce and they're going to try to shift very dramatically to serving adult learners. Meanwhile, this group of stakeholders has been doing this this entire time and testing and trying things out with people like you and me, right? And so that's going to really also put a tremendous amount of pressure on on our existing kind of status quo of how we think about education or workforce training. Mm -hmm. So very, very interesting, uh, the situation that you described in the U.S. I, I don't think it's uh, exactly the same in, in other places, but uh, we see some flavors of that depending on uh, on countries where education is mainly public or subsidized, mm -hmm. etc. But I, I, I believe it's uh, we see uh, some part of this uh, reality that you see in the U.S. in, in, in other places. In, in particular, I, um, I want to focus on... Uh, on the non um, non accredited work or micro credentials or um, lifelong learning after the degree um, and i see that there are some uh, areas uh, of disruption that are very clear particularly in um, uh, digital skills no uh, like a, a programmer a data science cybersecurity etc where we see that there are uh, some providers uh, that are offering things that are as uh, mm -hmm. uh, as demanded as maybe a, or more sometimes than a than a degree, no. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, in the universities, uh, we offer degrees, and we have uh, what we call continuing education. And in general, continuing education is like a second class, uh, I would say, thing compared to degree for degree. Mm -hmm education uh, that we offer because uh, maybe we obtain some funding there to subsidize other things that we do in the university. In other cases, it's for social reasons also, but in general, it's not at the same level, no? So uh, in, in the future, I believe that uh, uh, universities that take seriously this part of, uh, of uh, the university, the continuing education and boost it to become more uh, a lifelong learning. Some universities are calling this the the sixty year curriculum. Now, so that right. we um, we uh, we believe that the university has to be the partner uh, for the student or alumni for the rest of their lives. No. Yep. Uh, and uh, and um, creating these pathways for them to continue development uh, with the university or with other um, mm -hmm. areas. No, but how we can. Uh, become uh, partners uh, for the rest of their life, for formative partners. What, what do you think about this, uh, Michelle? Yeah, what? when you start to kind of look closely at, you know, the schools that are, you know, thinking rightly so about something like a 60-year curriculum, what I'm not yet fully seeing is a real reimagination of curricular development for that lifelong learner. I think we keep thinking, well, okay, if we need to adjust and serve working learners, let's offer a subscription model or let's chunk up this particular degree program or certificate into smaller bite-sized pieces so that people can consume this more easily. But they're not fully reimagining what that learning experience looks like. Right. And so one of the challenges that we've identified, right, is those human skills are going to be so incredibly important to be successful in this, you know, potential robot machine learning future that we're facing. Right. And we know that. But how do you actually build and advance and keep progressing in your sophistic sophistication of your human skills? right? How do you continue to build empathy for your customer or your client, right? How do you think about systems thinking? How are we going to actually build in those human skills into something that fits into the busy lives of a person who's working full-time, right? What does that learning experience look like? It can't just be a shorter lecture, right, that we currently give in our current model. We can't just kind of take one syllabus and cut it into smaller pieces and think that that's going to be maybe a stackable credential for someone. 
there has to be not only kind of a, a real meaningful signal to an employer that this this learning experience is valuable, but it's also got to entertain and engage us as learners, right? Because doing more education at the same time that we're managing work, our family lives, taking care of our you know aging parents or our kids or whatever the 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 situation may be. It has to keep us engaged and wanting to continue to learn because learning is hard work, right? When we're asking someone to come back to school, that's a huge proposition for someone who's working multiple part-time jobs or full-time jobs. It has to feel and look different. And that's what we're seeing, right, in these other players that are out there in the for-profit venture-backed world that are maybe doing these boot camps in really fascinating ways or thinking about that digital experience, you know, in a mobile environment or even just a cellular environment uh, to keep a learner persisting. That's something I think that we're not yet fully seeing uh, at an institutional level as they think about things like a 60 year curriculum. I think they're kind of realizing the importance of stretching you know, how we engage with learners and how we keep in contact with our alumni and how we maybe keep them coming back. What we haven't fully, I think, spent enough time on is, okay, once they've decided to come back, how am I going to prove to them that this is something truly valuable in the market and also something that will help them make true progress in their work lives? I think that's, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's a real kind of, that's the next step. Um, yes, yes, I was thinking, I was thinking not, uh, so, um, so to summarize uh, somehow what you said is uh, uh, the, one of the things that we need to do for this 60 year curriculum to work is to put the student at the center and understand the needs of a student that is very different. Uh, because our students that work, uh, have a life, a family life, et cetera, yeah. you have to keep them engaged. No, it's uh, the short lecture will not make the, 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 the work, but also uh, that the value proposition of the university is such that what they will obtain here is, uh, uh, it's something that will advance their careers. No? So from, mm -hmm. uh, we're talking a 60 year curriculum from uh, the degree to the job, from job to job, and from uh, 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 and from career to career, no, up to retirement. Yeah. Uh, so there are different kinds of uh, changes and things that we have to do uh, and demonstrate that uh, we will be able in universities uh, to become this uh, partner for the rest of their life. Yeah. Rest of learning. Yeah, it's um. You, you put it perfectly thinking, you know, that the answer here is to be truly learner centered. And I think one of the things, you know, that came out as I was doing a lot of the research for this, this book is that that idea of meeting learners where they are is a beautiful kind of turn of phrase. People like to say, you know, that they're really intent on meeting learners where they are. But when you actually, again, take that language and then look at what they're providing for the learners, it isn't actually truly meeting learners where they are. Because with you, me, with anyone else who's currently in the workforce, there's so many, there's so many things we bring to the table that extend far beyond our formal credential, whatever that credential may be, right? There's so much experience we've gained along the way but there's no way to actually necessarily put value or put words to it, right? I could, I could have learned so many of these human skills taking care of a grandparent who had Alzheimer's, right? Or I could have just gained a lot of work experience where I'm, you know, accumulating these kind of hidden credentials along the way. If I am engaging in a learning experience that truly meets me where I am, it will be able to say, listen, I know you've done these things and I know that you actually bring these specific hidden competencies to the table because I value these different experiences that you've had and these the ways in which you've exercised those competencies. 
but we don't have ways really kind of to dynamically recognize those kinds of skills we bring to the table. And that's really challenging, right? We have things like prior learning assessments, but they don't work in this dynamic format where anyone, even someone who maybe doesn't have a degree can prove that they have real knowledge, skills, and abilities, right? And that's, I think, one of the things we really have to start working on from a science of learning perspective is how do we begin to really start to codify and value and benchmark these kinds of workforce readiness skills to give people a better chance. Yes. So it's a, it's a real, uh, a, a real well, a lot, lots of challenges, but one, one, yeah. one challenge is, uh, that is very important. And, and also in a, a university setting, it's uh, complicated because, because of the emphasis that we have in higher ed more than long, long, lifelong learning. Yes. I believe that we need also to do more uh, research and uh, experimentation around that. And uh, the universities could be a good place to, to do that uh, with the uh, skills uh, of uh, researchers and people that we have. And uh, maybe some of these incentives will be when, uh, as you say, this tipping point on the number of enrollments on higher ed that uh, uh, universities, we have seen that in universities in other countries like uh, in Singapore, uh, where enrollments for uh, degree for degree education uh, is decreasing, universities have maintained their uh, budget uh, as they uh, are willing to grow their offering in lifelong learning. And also, we are seeing these shifts in other parts of the world, and uh, I hope that we will see these uh, changes also in the future in other parts uh, of the world. One one last question, uh, or uh, I don't know if it's a question or discussion is around uh, this uh, uh, conversation that we have had is uh, you have higher ed and you have lifelong learning, but there's like a, no real uh, interaction on, on this. And I, I believe that in the future we could see also um, more continuous on, continue on, on this, no? on, on, on higher ed and lifelong learning, on, on re returning to the university, for degree or not degree education, I, I, I'm not sure. So, what is your view on this? You do believe that we will still have a, a degree in uh, in something, and then you continue doing lifelong learning experiences, or do you see a, a revolution or a change in the future on the way higher education and lifelong learning interact more in a cyclic way? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I definitely do think. Um, there will always be value in a degree. You know, that's not going to just like somehow disappear and become uh, worthless. I do think you're right that it is, it isn't just going to be, you know, four years and then lifelong learning. It's, it's not that simple, especially given the numbers of working adults who are trying to complete their degrees or trying to pursue some sort of more advanced education. I do think there will be a turn toward thinking through how do we truly create stackable credentials that mean something, right? So you see different kinds of schools experimenting with this where in one particular example um, at BYU Pathway, they, they try to create a job certificate first with the idea that once someone is financially um, set in terms of not having to feel like they're in a constant hustle to survive, then they can maybe entertain the idea of continuing that and building from that certificate into a larger degree program. And so, and they've seen this actually bear out through the data where, you know, someone can actually become a diesel mechanic through a quick program and then suddenly they're making $80,000 a year. And that is the, you know, that maybe meets that threshold for family sustaining wages. And then they start to think, oh my gosh, this really paid off, right? Education really paid off. And they're seeing the persistence rates kind of increase in terms of people who are saying, okay, that's step one. Now I want more, right? I know that if I get this degree, it's going to even, you know, be more transformative in my life. So I think those are the kinds of pieces that, you know, rather than thinking about 
taking a specific degree b- program and kind of chunking it up into small pieces, it's going to be, okay, if I want to truly meet learners where they are, I need to kind of identify the pain points that they're grappling with. And for some of them, it may be financial, but some of them, it may just be, you know, very specific wraparound support services that are needed. They need real kind of childcare access or, you know, mental health supports or whatever the thing may be that's that's preventing them from making progress. I think that's the that's the piece that I think universities are going to get better at when they really start trying to break down in, in real concrete steps. What do we mean when we when we say that we're going to meet learners where they are? Right. What does that truly, you know, turn into in terms of how we change our behavior? Maybe it means that we start offering some of these things that we always offered on campus online, right? That's a simple kind of transformation. But sometimes it's about, nope, I need to actually feed these people dinner and watch their children while they carve out two hours to be able to continue moving forward, right? It's very kind of, it depends on who your adult learner is, but I think we're going to get better at those, those pieces of the equation as well. Oh, very, very interesting answer, uh, Michel. Uh, thanks for your thoughts that make us think on a very different way, a disruptive way of how higher education should be uh, rethinking uh, itself. Uh, and in general, the workforce uh, training uh, with this uh, book uh, around long life uh, learning that you have written. Uh, thanks again, uh, Michel, for your time and for sharing with us your views on lifelong learning and skills and jobs of the future. Thanks so uh, much for having me. It would surely be of great value for the Institute for the Future of Education audience, and I, I hope we can have you here soon. Sounds great. Would love to. Thanks.